Uh, I want to turn now to introducing Chancellor Glenn Johnson, and I don't have the resume. <laughs> so um, just, just speaking from the heart, Chancellor Johnson really has been uh, a champion of higher education in Oklahoma. Uh, very strong support for the mission of regional uni universities and community colleges. Uh, he, he knows from, from what he speaks because he was president of Southeastern uh, State University for 10 years and so he's been at a regional university. He knows what they're all about, what the mission is. Uh, former Speaker of the House, uh, author of legislation creating the Endowed Chair Program which uh, has greatly, greatly benefited Northwestern Oklahoma State University, and I think we still hold the distinction of the most endowed chairs of any of the regional institutions. Very proud of that, and I will turn it over to Chancellor Johnson. Well, thank you very much, President Cunningham, and uh, great to be here today. Great. Uh, drive and I'll try to get through this speaker as, as quickly as I can with your uh, responsibilities at the Capitol today. Uh, just a couple comments uh, first. Let me, uh, and we will be passing out uh, uh, a booklet if you would like to follow along today as we go through some of the information. Um, let's uh, begin. President, I've been on this campus many times. Uh, President Cunningham is always very gracious. Uh, she and her staff to serve as, as uh, uh, our host, and she's done that today. Great meal, great fellowship. So let's extend our thanks to President Cunningham for her role here. I see uh, Senator Bryce Marlette making it in. Welcome, and great to have uh, Senator Marlette here as always. Um, the uh, I want to comment uh, this presentation that we're. Uh, going through today uh, is a the combined work we start in July of each year a working uh, a speaker and members on our, our budget uh, request for the year and it's the work of uh, the state regents certainly our staff but the presidents and their business officers are very involved in this effort it's a joint effort and uh, uh, for those that are here today President uh, Butler and President Cunningham President Evans and certainly President Bryant who couldn't be here today? They they're great partners with me, and I want to uh, I want to always take the opportunity publicly to say what uh, uh, what an honor it is for me to work with each of them. Uh, we got a couple of our staff here today. They're uh, they're busy uh, uh, with handouts in the back. Dr. Blake Sonobi, our academic vice president. Dr. Sonobi, you might raise your hand as you're moving from table to table. And I think everybody knows Holly Hunt, our legislative director. Holly uh, on the left as well. Janet Jackson in my office is with us here uh, also. I must say, I said this at our table, uh, I had the opportunity, uh, I chaired Speaker Judiciary Committee before I uh, moved on to budget, appropriation budget, and ultimately the Speaker's office, but during those years I became acquainted with uh, your longtime district judge here, Judge uh, Ray Dean Lender. Uh, I had the opportunity as Speaker to come up here for uh, what was the, the best quail hunt of my life, nearly killed me, but uh, uh, as I told him at the table, I knew I was in trouble when he asked whether I wanted to break for lunch or not, and we didn't break for lunch, and by, uh, by the close of business that day, I had had the work out of my life. But what a great person. Uh, my district judge uh, in Oak Fusky County, you remember Judge Miracle. When I came back from that trip, Judge Linder, we talked about you, and uh, he made a statement that I agreed with that... Uh, uh, within the ranks of the Oklahoma judiciary, he said Judge Leonard was the most professional and frankly the finest judge in our system, and I agree with that, and I'm glad to be here with him today. I've got to say, uh, the speaker and I uh, had an opportunity to cross paths in 96, 97. Uh, between the legislature and my tenure at Southeastern, I was at the University of Oklahoma for a little over a year, and uh, I first became aware of the speaker when he was on the President Search Committee in 94, which ultimately uh, resulted in the selection of, of uh, President Boren as the student uh, member of that search committee. But uh, during that year, Speaker Hickman uh, uh, conducted the media work both for the President's office and the athletic office, which was a challenge, but I uh, uh, suspected then that he was gonna be involved in, in uh, 
larger uh, venue shortly, and that's exactly what's happened. He made the comment about looking at protecting education, and I think during his tenure that has happened. I need to mention as we start, we're here to talk about this next year's budget. But last year's a good example of what the speaker uh, referenced. We literally, 10 days before adjournment in May, it looked like higher education was going to get a 5% cut with no money for our debt service relative to our 2005 bond issue. Uh, through the efforts of our leadership, and certainly the speaker was a key player in that effort, the needle moved the last 10 days to where we ended up with a 3.5% cut and $8.6 million to plug in and to uh, essentially put in the base to uh, pay for the balance of the obligations on that 2005 bond issue. I think my point is that doesn't just happen. It happens when we have leaders and the others that are here that say, we can move this around, there's still time, there's still flexibility. In that case, it moved the needle to the good for higher education, about $25 million. I'd like to ask everybody to express our appreciation to the speaker and everybody for, for that effort. And I need to say before I start, Nick, I think your, your comments were, were great. They were on point. It reinforces why all of us do what we do, and uh, uh, we're very proud of the fact that you're a recipient of the Oklahoma's Promise Scholarship. Well, let, let me get right into achievements at our institutions, and I'll just share one for each. There are many. Uh, President Cunningham Northwestern was recognized as a best value school, uh, being fifth among most affordable uh, small universities in America. The organization reviewed over 20 700 institutions in making the selection. It talked about Northwestern's ethical leadership and service, critical thinking and fiscal responsibility, as well as being a great value with the overall cost of the students. Uh, South President Butler, Southwestern Oklahoma State University, great achievement with your College of Pharmacy, receiving news from the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, the two tests, the NAPLEX and the multi-state Students scored a 100% pass rate on both of those, if you can imagine that. The national average is right above 80%, and in both of those tests, uh, Southwestern students from their College of Pharmacy scored 100%. Congratulations to them. Uh, President Evans, the Washington-based Aspen Institute, announced that Northern Oklahoma College was selected as one of the top 150 community colleges in the nation, only a college in Oklahoma to be selected, and this now makes Northern eligible to apply for the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence, which carries with it a $100 million, or excuse me, a $1 million grant. I wish it was $100 million. We could change that and help out with the budget a little bit this year. And finally, I just want to recognize uh, Representative Murdoch. We had a great meeting about a month ago with President Bryant. Uh, what a quality person. He is retiring at the end of this year. and. Uh, I think, as our presence would say, he never misses a meeting. He's, uh, he wanted to be here today. Uh, just an outstanding guy. We, uh, <clears throat> President uh, uh, Brian invited Representative Murdoch and, and me to meet with him at 8 o'clock, and we ventured out into the cold. And the media was there, and we thought for sure that he was going to ask us to speak to the media as they started their chili cook-off. Instead, he gave us aprons and asked us to dip the chili, so we were glad to... <laughs> Glad to do that as he took the photo op, and that was appropriate. But uh, great guy and, and very understated, but certainly a, a, a super individual, and we're going to miss him in higher education. Uh, I think our theme today as we start, and the, the backdrop, of course, is the announcement two days ago on uh, we know now we're going to have, it looks like, a $900 million deficit for this coming year and even a revenue fair that we will need to address this year. So. I hope the message is clear as we go through this that higher education as a system has been preparing for this. As soon as the, we met with uh, your budget chair, speaker, uh, uh, Representative Sears in early September, also Senator Jolly for the senators and uh, Preston Dorflinger, and as soon as that meeting was over and we got the word, we started as a system uh, preparing and looking at cost savings and, and uh, all of the efficiencies that we could put together. So I hope the message today and, and I need to say, as, as we have our legislators that are here, Representative Wright, who has chaired the, uh, our higher ed committee, um, he's given us an opportunity, certainly when there's bills in that committee, to, uh, to come in and to uh, state our position. But over and above that, Representative Wright has, has allowed us uh, to 
acts as his committee, if you will, and he uses it as a forum to let us talk about uh, whether uh, pertinent issues that we may have, whether it's going in depth on uh, scholarships or financial aid or weapons on campus, whatever the issue, and we've been greatly appreciative of that. And, and, and certainly, uh, I need to say as well, Senator Marlette, you've always been there for us in the Senate. You've stood up for higher education. So uh, those that are here today, as we talk about next year, I do want to thank you for what you've done for us uh, uh, these last several years. And Speaker, I guess I should say also with you concluding your service, uh, 12 great years of service and uh, uh, you're, you're in your district, uh, the, the area that knows you best, but I think I, I speak statewide and I speak on behalf of higher education. You've been a, been a great supporter, you've been a leader and an advocate and we appreciate your service as well. I think this year is going to be all about change. Uh, we're seeing significant changes in higher education. Uh, I think some of the things I'm going to talk about this morning is reflective of the fact we're changing our business model, Bruce, to, to deal with that. And uh, I, I would also say, uh, particularly to our legislators that are here, what we roll out here today is not just something we're going to try to do to get us through the next six months. I think, and I hope you see it as really an effort to make some systemic changes. Uh, in the way we try to deliver our educational product to our student. And we have taken this challenge very seriously. Uh, I want to start out with our public agenda. Uh, I'm on page two in the booklet if you want to follow. Uh, but our public agenda really goes to the heart of what we stand for in higher education. Uh, our first priority is to increase the number of college graduates. Uh, no big surprise. Uh, we have been a, a partner with Governor Fallon and Complete College America since 2011. Uh, we know all the data. The data tells us that the states that have a higher percentage of their citizens with degrees to a state or states that have the higher per capita incomes, the stronger economies, the linkage with the needs that business uh, have for their workforce. And so we are engaged in a, in a very large degree. This is our top priority, not just this year or next year, but frankly, for the next eight years under Complete College America, I would predict well beyond that because I think produce, in this New knowledge-based economy, the states that have more college degree holders are, go are going to be the states that will be competitive. Our second major goal is twofold. The first is the effort to increase access to higher education. Very important. I think the, the president, certainly the state regents, the legislature has been a great partner with us, uh, have a very strong feeling of a student. Uh, Nick is a good example. who. Uh, shows that they have the ability to achieve in college. We want to give them the opportunity or the access to go to college. We have, we have a number of students that have that ability, but they don't have the financial means. And so to provide that access, we're still below the national average in terms of the percentage of our citizens with college degrees. So access to college is very important. And I think one of the key components in our state, you uh, can literally, within 50 miles, there is a college or university that uh, our students have the opportunity to access. At the same time, we want to continue our efforts to improve the quality of the educational product. Now, the delivery is very different. I think you're seeing with the onset of online education, uh, the, the professor lecturing to the class is still a component to some degree, but you're seeing flipped classroom concepts. You're seeing all kinds of different methods through online education to deliver the product. The professor remains the key ingredient to the quality of the product and also our accrediting entities which I'm proud to say that our system meets all of the accrediting levels. We have many uh, of our college and universities that seek additional levels of accreditation to enhance the quality of their degrees. Finally, our last priority is one that I would say that our faculty takes extremely seriously and that is the challenge to make sure that they do everything they can uh, to when students leave our college and universities to see that they have the tools to succeed, that they are prepared not just to compete but to succeed in today's economy. They give our students the tools to critically think and to problem solve and to analyze. We know, you just look at how technology, look at our smartphones today and think back 15 years and look at all the changes. Think about what we're going to be confronted with 15 years from now. We can't teach the answer today to a question that our students will be faced with, but we can give them those tools where they're going to be in a position to respond and to respond accurately and effectively. So these three goals essentially drive our strategic decisions, our budget decisions, and our operational decisions in higher education. 
Next, I'd like to go to our legislative agenda. This year, it's uh, concise. We thought that would be important. Degree completion is uh, certainly our top priority through Complete College America. Our second uh, major initiative is to maintain the current law with regard to weapons on campus. Uh, probably should say a couple things. Higher education does not oppose the Second Amendment or gun ownership, but we do believe the current law is working. The current law provides the opportunity for the president, when the president deems it appropriate, when the circumstances merit it, to authorize individuals to carry weapons on our campuses. Uh, we did a survey earlier in the year that's happened in the last couple of years, 17 different times. So it has happened. I authorized it when I was president of Southeastern. And our position is that uh, the president is the, the person best equipped to make that call in conjunction with consultation with campus law enforcement and area law enforcement. We do continue to take the position that uh, wholesale weapons on campus uh, really only create a more dangerous scenario for students and, and faculty and staff and visitors and alumni on our campuses. Our law enforcement community uh, strongly backs that position. They say their worst nightmare would be to, was to come into an emergency if multiple people have guns and to not know who is perpetrating and who's trying to to help. So we uh, continue our position that the current law works and to oppose any legislation that would allow uh, carrying of weapons on campus. Our third major initiative is Oklahoma's Promise. Nick's already referred to this. Uh, you think about it, other states call our program one of the most transformational college access programs in the country. Since 1992, I was uh, in the legislature when we passed the first bill. Uh, we've provided scholarships now to over 65,000 students, uh, 18,000 currently. Uh, you look at all the data points, they compare at every data point well to the general student population. They have higher high school grade point averages, higher ACT scores, higher freshman and college grade point averages. The persistence rate from the freshman to sophomore year in college is higher. They have higher graduation rates. Ultimately, more Oklahoma's Promise students stay in the state and have jobs in the state after graduation. This program works, and it works very well. We just, uh, our goal would be to keep it intact as we go forward into this uh, new year. And then finally, our last request is our uh, fiscal year uh, 17 budget request, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, clear that we have challenges. The speaker outlined uh, those from the budget perspective very well. We also have challenges in terms of producing graduates to meet our job needs. You've seen this slide as the governor has gone around the state uh, as far as the skills gap. And what this slide tells us is that in the next 10 years, we have got to, as a system, produce more certificate holders, more associate degrees, and more bachelor's degrees to meet the current and future workforce needs. Another study that brings it home even quicker is the Georgetown study. On this next slide, what it tells us, and this data was customized for Oklahoma, that by 2020, which as you think about, it's only four years away, we're two weeks away from 2016, by 2020, 67% of the jobs in the state will require some college, a long-term certificate, or a college degree, and 37% of those jobs will require an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or higher. So certainly we feel that pressure, it's on us, and that's why Complete College America and degree completion is so important. Uh, the governor has defined this well through her Oklahoma's Works initiative. Uh, I would define Oklahoma Works as the effort to link the education pipeline in career tech, K through 12, and higher education directly to what our workforce needs are. The governor's been uh, all over the state this fall. She's had nine meetings uh, with uh, regional meetings with key economic network members and, and has certainly been well received by the business leadership and the educational leadership in those areas. Going directly to outcomes, every September, so this information is still hot off the press, we match uh, our graduates with the data from the Employment Security Commission. Uh, we came out this year, this is a great result of what the data tells us, is that one year after graduation from our colleges and universities in Oklahoma, 85% of our graduates stay in the state, but more importantly have jobs in the state of Oklahoma. You go back to the energy downturn in the mid 80s, that was not the number then. I think we all uh, were concerned at that point that graduates were having to seek employment in other states because the, the jobs were not here. So great number and, and certainly on page eight, I think one of the reasons we have made as a system of higher education, 
Over the last decade, a much more directed effort to link our academic programs to what business tells us their needs are. I've listed a few areas there like healthcare and nursing, no big surprise, and uh, speaker referenced uh, Northwestern's uh, uh, nurse practitioner program. We are, as Dr. Snowby is here, we're, we're moving along well and hope to have uh, that on our agenda, speakers, members of the legislature here at the January meeting. And we'll, this isn't the place to talk more about it other than I want to commend Northwestern for bringing it forward. So. Uh, but other areas where we've linked those programs are business and engineering, aviation, aerospace, new, new areas like wind turbine technology and telecommunication, data science and analytics. This is really important from two standpoints. If you're linking in, in our college and universities our programs to what business says their needs are, there are internship opportunities for students while they're going to college, but more importantly, permanent jobs when they graduate from college. The data remains very, very clear, although there are some that continue to question the value of a college degree. Uh, this is uh, information from earlier this year from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. On an average in the United States, if you compare a college degree holder to a high school diploma holder, the college degree holder on an average will earn over 22000 a year. The, uh, you take that for a career lifetime, and the individual with the, uh, who has worked uh, with a college degree over their entire career uh, earns on an average when you compare them to their counterpart with a high school diploma earns over 1.1 million dollars more so there's significant economic value to earning your degree I would I would submit there are a lot of other important reasons to earn your degree as well all the data shows that those that have college degrees are the most civically engaged citizens they graduate from our college and universities. They go into their communities. And in addition to improving the quality of life, they are the leaders in the community. They are the most civically engaged members of the community. So a lot of reasons that a college degree is very important. Again, the challenges are there. You look at the data. Nationally, 30% uh, of our adults 25 and older hold college degrees. That percentage in Oklahoma right now today is 24.2%. So that tells us we have work to do, but it also tells us, and we know we have a game plan called Complete College America that's already serving to close this gap in a very significant way. I'll give you the numbers on that in just a moment, but I think the good news is we have a plan that addresses that gap and that variance right now. So let's go to Complete College America. Why all of a sudden, I'm asked, why five years ago did it seem like overnight you start talking about how important college degrees were. And it seems like since then that's been the, the major focus. Well, I think this slide answers that question better than anything I could say. Because this slide essentially shows that over the last two decades, the United States has slipped from being first in the world in producing the largest number of college degree holders. We've slipped all the way from first to 16th. And I think essentially our feeling is that's not where we want to be. It's certainly not where we plan to stay. As a result, uh, in September of 2011, we kicked off the Complete College American Initiative with Governor Fallon on the campus of UCO. We got a big boost that day because the leadership of Complete College America, who had invited the 34 states that are involved to participate, you don't just join, you have to be invited to participate. The leadership announced that day that the best plan, the national model plan, was the, the plan that we submitted in the state of Oklahoma. And so I'll just quickly run through that plan since it's been referenced as the national model. I might also say we represent rights gone to uh, uh, our meetings. We were the first state that included on our leadership team uh, members of the legislature and, and members of the cabinet to serve in those roles. Now that's become a best practice and all states are required to do that. President Cunningham has been a member of that leadership team since we started back in 2011, and, and she's provided great leadership for us as well. Uh, the five points, the first one focuses uh, directly on college readiness. It makes sense. If you don't prepare students in high school for success in college, the likelihood that they're going to be successful is greatly diminished. We provide, higher ed provides an e-pass testing program for in both the 8th and 10th grade where students can determine how they're doing in reading and math and science. Uh, we're one of a, a handful of states that's been funded for all three Gear Up programs. And I think as most of you know, Gear Up is a program that's designed specifically to give uh, students in high school the tools they need to be successful in college. 
Remediation, our position is don't get into the blame game, but instead through co-requisite courses and other initiatives, get students into the remedial courses, let them earn that credit and get on with the business of earning their degree on time. Pathways to completion, uh, again, co-requisite courses are extremely important here, but also we have great partnerships through cooperative agreements with our career tech partners where students can take courses for co uh, college credit while they're enrolled in career tech. Performance funding, uh, we just received uh, communication uh, a couple weeks ago from the United States Business Roundtable. We went to performance funding three years ago where our funding is based on increasing our retention rates and ultimately our graduation rates. Uh, the U.S. Business Roundtable have reviewed the states that have gone to performance funding and have judged that our uh, particular model is, in their words, the most comprehensive of any state that is, is developing a performance funding model. And finally, adult degree completion, which is critical to our success. You go back to the data, the data shows in our state that the high school to college directly uh, from high school to college population is starting to level off and as that happens if we're going to be successful in producing more college degrees and certificates we've got to look to our adult students our underrepresented students uh, the numbers tell us that we have over 70,000 students in this state with 72 hours or more towards their college degree but they don't have their degree every campus here and our other campuses that aren't here today are involved in our a uh, portion of adult degree completion called Reach Higher, which is a combination of traditional instruction and online instruction. Get students, most of them are place bound, back into the college environment where they earn their degree. That increases the value to themselves, but certainly to their state as well. There's a couple of areas where we've been singled out uh, in the last, uh, during this fall for participation. And I'll just mention them quickly, uh, Complete College America, selected Oklahoma as one of eight states to participate in the National Scaling Co-Requisite Initiative. This basically provides uh, opportunities for students to move, move through the remedial courses and gateway courses uh, quicker, both in high school uh, and the first year of college in order to earn their degree on time. We just were picked two weeks ago by the Charles Dana, Dana Center at the University of Texas to participate in their math pathways to completion project. All of these recognize again that Oklahoma is one of the top states in this degree completion initiative. Well, let's look at the numbers. We said we were gonna bump up the number of degrees and certificates significantly. The numbers are, are behind me and in your booklet on page 16. Basically, when we started, we were producing 30,500 degrees and certificates a year in our state. The goal within 12 years was to move that to 50,900, a 67% increase. Very significant, very comprehensive. To do that, it would require 1,700 additional degrees and certificates each year for the next 12 years. Well, let's look at the numbers. We didn't meet that goal the first year. We exceeded it with 2,945. The second year, we doubled it with 3,577, with the goal being 1,700. And then this last year, Governor Fallon announced uh, in September at our Regents Education Program that we had exceeded the goal again in year three with 1,842. We need to thank our, our colleges and universities, our presidents, our regents, and the governor and the legislature for making this a priority and certainly, again, uh, three years into this, we're doing well, but our goal is to uh, keep ringing the bell and exceeding those numbers every year for the next eight years where we end up exceeding that goal in year 12. Again, the speaker referenced the budget. It's on everybody's mind. I thought it might be good to start off with an overview with the benchmark being the national recession back in 2008 and to see what higher ed is a system where the budget has gone since 2008. You can see from that slide, uh, the low water mark was fiscal year 12, and we've uh, there's been a slight increase since then that again is tapering off. Uh, in bottom line dollars, we the state system of higher education, our 25 college and universities, are 87 million dollars below funding where we were in fiscal year 08. So over the last eight years, we've essentially dropped 87 million dollars. At the same time, our enrollment uh, on our campuses is, has increased historically. So more students on campus, less resources to provide uh, the educational opportunities for the students creates a lot of pressure on our system. 
looking at it another way on page 18, and this is a broad view of essentially 35 years in terms of the percentage of the state budget going to higher education. You can see back in 1980, 18.6% of the budget went to higher education. Today, that number uh, is 14.4. So there's been over a 4% decline in the last 35 years. This is one of those situations where it really is a zero sum game where if, if other institutions, and there are several, have received more a cut of the pie, uh, higher ed and common ed, to be specific, have received a lesser percentage during that time. Another way to look at this would be to look at the higher education dollar and look at the percentage of the higher education dollar that's come from state appropriations. Back in 1988, essentially three-fourths or 74.2%, uh, essentially 75%, of the higher ed dollar came from state appropriations. Today, in, in 2016, that number is 35.1%. So the legitimate question is, well, if it's dropped that much, where is the money gone? Essentially, it's gone to four other major areas. No big surprise, there's been an exponential increase in healthcare costs and Medicaid during that time. That's been one of the major reasons, but also through implementation of the Pinnacle Plan at the Department of Human Services, their budget has increased, the corrections budget has increased. I know we have a member of the department here and they are well over 100%, 120% uh, capacity, and additionally, the Department of Transportation budget has increased. But as I say, when it's a zero-sum game, as those areas get more of the pie, higher education has received a lesser percentage of the pie, which brings us to this year. Uh, the numbers were announced Tuesday, $900 million shortfall next year, budget failure, revenue failure this year. And so we uh, put together our budget request with those uh, very sobering um, uh, bits of information in mind. As I mentioned, we've met with uh, Senator Jolly, the Senate Appropriation Chair, uh, Representative Sears, the House Appropriation Chair, and the Governor's Secretary of Budget Finance, Preston Dorflinger, and certainly have calculated those discussions as we release our budget request for this year, which essentially, uh, as you can see, we're requesting uh, from the legislature and from the Governor a flat budget. No increase but a flat budget being cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, with this kind of a shortfall even though we certainly have needs relating to degree completion and, and other needs of our students but uh, if we are anything we are realistic and we felt this year it would be uh, responsible and appropriate to ask for a flat budget on page 22 and talking with representative sears and senator jolly and, and secretary dorflinger we ask about our fixed costs and they indicated that they, they wanted uh, entities like higher ed and, and others, if there's special funding needs, to put those in an addendum. Our fixed costs, of course, I think as everybody here knows, our, our utilities, our retirement costs, our health care costs, our workers' comp costs, which, uh, again, if not funded, will, will only increase the, uh, uh, the deficit and the cut. So that represents our cut in a nutshell. What I really want to talk about more briefly today is what we're doing in preparation for this shortfall. And I think you can see in these next couple of slides, we have taken this budget deficit very seriously. And I'm just going to reference a couple of, can't do all of them, but every institution provided to me and our staff their top two initiatives to achieve efficiencies and to achieve cost savings. Uh, we're seeing joint degree programs between institutions where one institution offers the general education courses, the other, the specialized program. We've had several that have come forward uh, to do that. Cameron University and Rogers in elementary education, Southeastern, East Central in nursing. Uh, several campuses are, are going and already offering early retirement uh, incentive programs in order to, uh, to save money. Uh, sharing faculty between institutions. This is something that, uh, quite frankly, is very innovative where institutions are going together and sharing a faculty member to provide those courses uh, to the students and, and in, the, in the same vein will also achieve cost savings. Uh, we've got institutions that have already eliminated sports teams, Redlands Community College, both their equine program and their volleyball program. Uh, two institutions have closed athletic facilities, both at uh, uh, Oklahoma City Community College and Southeastern, uh, with both of those institutions closing their aquatics facilities. Every institution in the system is in, has initiated travel reduction programs 
Uh, we've seen uh, energy savings. Uh, every institution in the system has an energy retrofit project. We have been big players as a system of higher education in the governor's energy savings initiative. And so we have uh, documented significant savings. OSU started, took the lead on this several years ago. Their savings this year exceed $5 million. Uh, several institutions are consolidating administrative positions. Uh, we are seeing the combining of campus sites. Uh, I'll mention in particular, although there are others, Connor State College, that they have a, a port campus and a west campus, and they're merging those sites. Uh, institutions are coming together to consolidate their health care coverage to save money. Through boards, they're consolidating back office functions like accounting and payroll and human resources, again, in an effort to save money and, and consolidate those functions uh, in, in a central location to provide those to all the institutions. Uh, they've gone together on risk management consortiums to save money. Uh, Rogers State University has a very innovative program on virtual desktop computers uh, that essentially saves on licensing fees and replacement costs. And so these are just a few. I could list many, many more, but I hope the message is clear. We're not saying we have a budget problem and saying we hope it gets worked out. We are bringing forward to the legislature very specific initiatives that show what we're trying to do in an effort to be ready, to be prepared, and to deal with this budget shortfall going into this year. But as I said earlier, this isn't just a six-month Band-Aid. This is a systemic change and one that we uh, believe will help us become more efficient and, quite frankly, deliver a better academic product to our students. Well, legitimate question. If your numbers on the budget have gone down, uh, if your student enrollment has gone up, what have you done on tuition? The speaker referenced Many states have had double-digit increases in tuition over the last decade, not so in Oklahoma. Our numbers have been below 5%. If you look at the slide, over this last eight-year period, we've averaged a 4.5% increase in tuition, which is very significant, one of the lowest in the nation. And that's because our process works. The process, the legislature establishes the limits. Uh, the state regents then work with uh, the colleges and universities, students have input in the process, faculty have inputs, the presidents make the recommendation to their governing board who makes the recommendation for tuition to the state regents. State regents have an all day hearing on this issue in April each year and it's resulted in tuition that's been below 5% over the last eight years. Very different than California and Illinois and Arizona and Georgia where it's been in the high double digits. Uh, a recent report from the U.S. Department of Education shows, and this only deals with our four-year institutions, our regional universities, and our two research institutions, OU and OSU, ranks as third in overall affordability in the country. Uh, only, uh, if you look at the, uh, the notebook there on page 26, only Utah and Wyoming have uh, lower rates than the state of Oklahoma higher ed system. And so, again, that's, that's very, very significant. Uh, one other thing that I thought would be important, uh, particularly for our members of the legislature to see, as this budget's gone down over the last eight years, our commitment to scholarships and financial aid for students has actually gone up. If you look at this slide, and we took it all the way back to 2000, but while the budgets have been declining, we've actually increased our allocation for scholarships and financial aid by over 6.2% during that same time. So what that's Basically, happened. what has happened, we've had a reallocation within our budgets where we've made scholarships and financial aid an even higher priority. Affordability is a big issue. Uh, in last year, the Southern Regional Education Board, which is our entity that uh, Oklahoma participates with 15 other states in the eastern quadrant of our country, they determined that it would be important to have a national study on college affordability to look at state appropriations, tuition, Pell, financial aid, the whole package. They asked me to chair it, I think, quite frankly, because of our uh, good record on affordability uh, uh, in terms of low tuition. Senator Jim Halligan and Representative Lee Denny were also asked to serve on the commission. We will have a report in March, but I think it will be a, a very interesting report and one that will give us some best practices to follow going forward. Uh, one of the things that came out of the commission, which we thought was interesting, uh, was a finding that coordinating boards, and we certainly have one here in Oklahoma, uh, those that have coordinating boards, uh, those states that have coordinating boards, have lower costs for tuition and lower for student costs. So we're very pleased with that. 
Uh, on the next slide, on page 30, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce this year, in terms of affordability, ranked all 50 states, not just on tuition and fees, but housing and books and all the related costs of going to college, ranked Oklahoma fifth in the nation in terms of overall college affordability. Certainly a, a, a great ranking. In STEM, uh, this has been a priority for the governor and legislature, science, technology, engineering, and math. Two big takeaways there over the last five years, higher education has played a key role, producing over 6,000 new graduates in the STEM disciplines, which resulted in a 28% increase in STEM degrees over the last five years. Student debt's another key area. You hear the national stories about uh, a trillion dollars in debt, and unfortunately those stories in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times are based on a lot of East Coast schools and a lot of Ivy League private schools. The story in Oklahoma on student debt is dramatically different and, and quite a bit better. Three takeaways. First of all, 45% of our students leave our college universities graduating with uh, zero student debt. So half our students have no student debt. Those that do have debt are 30% below the national average. And all that's resulted in a ranking in Oklahoma where we rank seventh in the nation in terms of our students leaving our college and universities with the least amount of student debt. You may have seen on page 33, Forbes magazine in July ranked the states in terms of the best places for recent college graduates to locate. Forbes magazine ranked Oklahoma second in the nation, citing consistently low tuition rates, good starting salaries, good per capita incomes, and consistently low unemployment rates. OETA, our public television uh, outlet in the state, conducted a survey in February and asked the open-ended question of what is the most valued state service. We were very pleased that uh, higher education tied with the Oklahoma National Guard as being the number one top valued service. Uh, finally, uh, we had a report from Dr. Bob Doffenbach at the, from the Price College of Business at OU uh, that told us several things, but it essentially said over the last decade, as far as income generated in this nation, there's been $1 trillion of income generated in the United States. The key finding was of that trillion dollars, 93% came from individuals that had college degrees. So certainly higher education plays a key role in wealth generation. I'll just close by saying a couple of things. Uh, budget cuts are gonna be significant. That's no big surprise. We understand the difficult decision our House and Senate members are gonna be going through between now uh, and May and making those calls. I've been on that side of the aisle as President Butler has as well. And uh, we want, today we want you to know we wanna be partners with you. We don't wanna say here's our request and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see you in May. We understand the dilemma. We want to work with you on it. I think, again, the data is very clear. If you're looking at your decisions in terms of what's the best return on investment, I think we can make a strong case. There's not a better return on investment than higher education. The Battelle report last year said that higher ed has a $9.2 billion impact on the state's economy for every dollar the legislature appropriates. $4.72 is returned directly back to Oklahoma's economy. Uh, look at the endowed chair program that President Cunningham referenced. Where else in government do private individuals and, and, and private companies provide their dollars to college and universities because they believe in what's going on there? Certainly a, a great partnership, but it again reinforces the value and importance of higher education. As we heard from Nick today uh, on a very personal level, uh, higher education and a college degree opens doors for students and helps them build their career. We see how it changes lives. I had a chance to participate in three commencements this last weekend. Uh, as you see those students walk across the stage, you see how it changes their life. So we want to be good partners in the process. We understand uh, the responsibility is on our back to make the case, to persuasively make the case for the importance of, in this year, again, being realistic, I think our request would be uh, to, as we're making a flat budget request, to minimize the cut to higher education, to protect higher education so we can continue to produce graduates who will meet these job needs, so we'll continue to show that great return on investment, and we'll continue to produce citizens who will stay in this state, nine out of ten of them will stay in this state, and certainly uh, contribute to the quality of life in our state. That's our challenge. I think our message here today is we understand 
how tough it's going to be, but we are ready to get to work with you. We value the partnership. We value uh, the fact that you have not made cuts across the board in the past, but have established priorities, and we hope we can earn a position of being one of the core priorities in the budget this year and, and, and hopefully uh, protect higher ed as a system and, and minimize any budget cuts to uh, our colleges and universities. With that, we are ready to get to work, and uh, thank you so much for your attention and for uh, being here today uh, on the campus of Northwestern. Thank you.